in this life. So it's not something I, I do now, but, but I used to do. Um, and I suppose being a fire investigator is a bit like those programs on the telly, you know, the CSI, you need that inquiry in mind, attention to detail, you need to be tenacious, but it's also a bit like archaeology because with fires, there's a lot of debris to work through and you're excavating with trails on your hands and knees. So um, I'm going to really whiz through some of these and tell the, tell the fire stories and, and some of, you know, how some of these sort of stories ended. As I say, I'm not going to speak about the pier, but maybe towards the end, if you've got any questions, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So this is my first little fire story. This is a church fairly near to here, actually, um, Wilmington. Well, I must just say that a lot of these fire stories, I'll keep anonymous, so you know, it might be that some of you have been involved in fires or whatever, so I will keep them a bit anonymous, so I won't use names and addresses, but um, except for a couple where they've actually been in the public domain. This was a serious uh, church fire in uh, Wilmington, actually, some, some years ago. Um, and I, I said about the sort of crime scene, you see bits of uh, church furniture here. And one of the things you'd be saying to yourself, well, why is that laying there? It could be that the firefighters have accidentally damaged something, because often firefighters have been smashing doors and windows and in the smoke and the heat and the, and the darkness, they can't see anything. But, but this didn't look right. And, what you see here is what we would term protection marks because when you get soot and smoke from a fire, it leaves this imprint. So what you can forensically say, if you ever had to go to court, you could say, well actually, we, we can demonstrate forensically. Those things were there either before the fire or very early on. The other thing, I, you know, I, I did have to go to court several times because you're regarded as an expert witness if you're a fire investigation officer. So, you know, that, that makes pretty good sense there, but actually those things, you know, are not where they would, you would normally expect to find them. So, you know, the question is what went on uh, before the fire? And what went on in this case was that um, when I examined the scene in, in conjunction with the scenes of crimes officer, what you'd now call sort of crime crimes scene investigator, is that there was no obvious accidental cause. You, you eliminate, is there electrical appliances, was there candles? Um, it, you know, in this case in the church there wasn't a lot, there was a, an organ as well. And you conclude, well actually the most likely cause was deliberate. And sure enough, witnesses had talked about someone that had been in the church, pacing up and down, agitated, mumbling. And then of course you've got this smashed up furniture. And that, and that was the conclusion that someone purposely set fire to this church, albeit no one was ever brought to justice. Uh, this uh, was quite an interesting one, and this is the headlines from the evening Argus. Um, and note the date, 2008, but I attended this incident in 2005, which just demonstrates sometimes how long it takes for the criminal justice system and, and mechanisms to work. I think, as I recall, part of it was because there was some uh, sort of psych uh, psychiatric assessments. But this was quite an interesting one. I, I always get very suspicious when I turn up at a fire and someone says, oh, a passing firefighter, how to rescue them? And I thought, oh, that's a bit strange. This was in, uh, actually in Barkham. And um, where's my little laser point here? Um, those that have sort of got a trained eye might spot something a, a bit strange here, particularly on this pine bench. It's not very clear, maybe, but I'll show you another picture here in a moment. And, this is the bench here. Uh, you wouldn't normally expect to see a very straight burn line like that. Uh, so if I go back one, see this very straight burn line. And um, what happened was um, there were um, two females that lived together. One had previously worked in the police and uh, she'd gone out and unbeknown at the time, she'd actually set fire to this place, left her partner up in bed. And the partner was, this is the staircase up the bedroom, was trapped and uh, was summoned help from the, the window and was rescued by, just happens uh, an off-duty firefighter lived next door, as a stoker luck maybe. Um, and going back to this line, I, I saw straight away, this was a bit strange. And then of course you, you say we need the police here, we need scenes of crime here, and you ramp it all up. And this is typical of someone pouring in a liquid and it, uh, petrol and running off that bench and obviously it's sort of run off the edge there and that's where you've got a very straight line and sure enough um, traces of petrol were found and this person was, was taken to, uh, through the criminal justice system 
it turned out also they, they um, defrauded people of up to fifty thousand pounds worth of debt. There was there was, um, there was a whole series of um, lies. I, I don't know what they were sentenced to, but that, that was that story. Now, if I said to you, whose house like this? This is probably you're all saying, yeah, mine looks like that. I hope it doesn't. But lifestyle can be blue. The sort of dysfunctional kitchen. Come on, who's going to put their hands up and say, oh, that's just like <laughs> It'd be embarrassing if someone said, oh yeah, that is, or that is my house. Um, but actually, again, from a fire investigation officer's point of view, you think, hmm, something's a bit strange here. Uh, it's dysfunctional. And I remember, mum wasn't at home. There was five or six young kids running in and out. And um, I did spot some medication on the uh, kitchen windowsill called Ritalin. Some of you might have heard of Ritalin. It's a, a, a drug often used, uh, used to treat... Uh, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. That was one of my first clues. Um, the actual fire was in this, uh, where's my point of view? was in this uh, sort of outbuilding here. Uh, and it was, again, it had no electricity, there was no obvious ignition source, just loads and loads of toys. Um, so you may be already starting to see where this one's going. And this was the uh, fireplace in the living room. Now I draw attention to a padlock here and a hook here. And you can look at the gas fire and think people have been shoving things in there. And I remember making a bit of a flim, flipping comment. Well, oh, you know, what, what, what's all this? One of the young children said, oh yeah, little Jimmy or whatever. So was saying, yeah, he used to keep shoving things in the fire. And um, if you look, I mean, you can't see it, but the fire, the fire's in this now, chair. And uh, ultimately, I, on my hands and knees, shoveled through all this debris in that, that little sort of uh, out, uh, store there. And of course, I, uh, there was no obvious explanation as to why that fire had started. You know, there was no electricity, or again, there was, there was just nothing, just toys, you know. And I think some of the toys I purchased and thought, hmm, probably not. And I basically concluded it was most likely, a, you know, a human act, as we would say. And I hadn't long left the scene when one of the children actually kind of fessed up to the police and said, yeah, I, I did it. So um, that, that was that story. Now this is, uh, this one does make me chuckle, although obviously it's not funny if you've, you've had a fire. This is a, it's not a great picture there, but this is a uh, flat above a garage, uh, looking into the, the entrance at the back of the flat. This picture might be a bit better, no, it's not much better. There's a, when the firefighters first went in, they said, we couldn't get in. And it turned out there was a settee sticking across the hallway. And you thought, well, why was that? And it was most bizarre. This settee was just sticking in the hallway. And uh, if I go back, forgive me, it's not very clear when you can zoom it all up, but there's stairs up to the top of the flat here. And um, the gentleman had actually gone to hospital with, with burns to the face. Not life threatening, but they had burns to the face. And um, Somebody actually went to the hospital and, and got a bit more information from them. You can see this settee here. This is a bedroom we're in here, and the bathroom's just across the hallway. And it turned out they'd come into this bedroom, they'd lit a cigarette, and they, the phone went. And they dashed up to the top of the flat, sitting on the phone. And then suddenly there's smoke coming down the corridor. And of course, they put the phone down, rushed down to this bedroom, come into this bedroom, this settee. It's on fire. So what do they do? Probably like a lot of us, they go to the bathroom and get some wet towels and water and chuck it on the settee. It doesn't put the fire out. So what do they do? This is the bit that makes me chuckle, but you can understand why it happens. They start to jump, drag, drag the settee out. They drag the settee out of the bedroom. Of course it gets stuck, doesn't it, in that tiny corridor. <laughs> now what are you going to do? Well, now he's got to jump over the thing. So to get out, it jumps over the thing and, and, and burns their face. So I come along and I'm putting all these pieces of the jigsaw together and sure enough when I've done my bit of archaeology in the, in the debris and I've got some witness evidence, sure enough I find the remains of uh, a lighter in, in the debris underneath the settee and, and my conclusion was, you can't always be 100% sure with these things, but my conclusion was it was probably a faulty lighter, one of these cheap lighters maybe, and they'd lit the cigarette, phone had gone, dropped it down, and it must have still been a light and set fire with the thing. So this one does make me chuckle a bit, well it probably shouldn't because uh, they were very, very <laughs> lucky, very lucky. And, and that's the thing with fires, people behave as you don't 
expect them to. And I think, you know, when you're delivering fire safety messages and, and, and the learnings, that's one of the things, you know, that's why we investigate fires. <coughs> If my house is on fire at two, three in the morning, how would how would I behave? I think if it's your own home, it's probably totally different. Okay, this is a bit better photo because we're into digital now. Where's the other one? So wet film. That's how old some of them are, but uh, well, how old I am maybe. But this is a fairly innocuous looking bungalow. In, in um, I, I can be specific to, on this one because it did get make the media. It was in Rottingdo. Nothing obvious from the outside. And actually it was a fairly small fire. Now, again, the, the details have not really come up here, but you can see there's some smoke staining in sooting, there's some handprints on the wall there, uh, where firefighters didn't smoke, you know, going and search. And it was the typical bungalow, bathroom, kitchen, all off this one sort of hallway. Now, this is uh, kitchen units, kitchen sink, uh, and it, um, the outside of the kitchen cupboards here are bad, and straight away I thought this, this doesn't look right because the, what what started this fire by the kitchen sink? There's nothing obvious. Um, why why would you have a, the the fire was probably well it has occurred on the outside. If you imagine these doors were shut, I've opened there, and this is the view the other side of the kitchen. Um, lots of smoke staining. There's a couple of pots and pans there now. It's unfortunate it's not showed up very well here. There's some blood just down here. Anyone want to chuck out some things? What, what might have been going on here? Kitchens, what typically happens or what might have happened here? Injured themselves with a knife cutting something, suddenly knocked a pan. Mm. Because it done. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'll add a bit more detail between the two pictures. <clears throat> It's a shame because when you put all this together at home, it's clearer than when you, you project it uh, uh, on a big screen like this. But between the two pictures, there's a galley kitchen. Come into the kitchen, there's a conservative oven. That unfortunately, there was a, an elderly lady that's found dead uh, with blood coming from her head. And she was dragged part way towards the conservatory by firefighters. And the, the practice is if they're often obviously dead, then you leave them in situ because forensically you can find out a lot more. So any more, any more of what may or may not happen here? One of the theories I would hypothesise, for example, is given there was a couple of sort of wok type uh, appliances on the cooker, they may have set fire to all and set fire to their clothing and themselves and then collapsed and then could they bang their head. I remember one of my colleagues saying, well, perhaps, you know, something flammable gone down the sink. I thought, no, it's just, just not likely. Um, um, so this was actually my, my one and only uh, fire scene murder. It uh, turned out, we didn't realise at the time, but the, the, the woman did actually have quite a bit of blood coming from her head. Uh, and the autopsy, I think, was done the next day. She actually been hit on the head about seven times, I think it was six or seven times, with a blunt metal instrument. And what was really um, fascinating was it was almost like a something off the telly really because this lady and I've actually printed some of so I'll read you a couple of excerpts. She was um, she she previously lived uh, under the um, Saturn the same machine. And I remember the police at the time saying we really put a lot of resources in this. We put in one of these strategic gold blah 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 um, sort of uh, strategic gold command um, plans into place. And it was most bizarre because um, she was living there with her daughter and son-in-law. And the son-in-law was uh, uh, Iraqi. And uh, she'd actually previously been married to the son-in-law as of, like a marriage of convenience. Her husband thought before that was, was an oil minister under the Saddam Hussein, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, regime and had been, um, actually been executed she fled the country. What was, um, how this actually panned out was that um, it was clearly murder. There was lots of forensic evidence. What had happened is she'd been hit over the head and white spirit had been poured in her body and set fire. And that's why kitchen units were bad because she was close to the kitchen units. And um, I, I didn't follow the case in detail. And in fact, I expected to be called to court, but I wasn't because quite often they call a forensic scientist in and they give evidence and, that, and that's what happened in this case. But I'll never forget um, 
when it when it came out in the media that uh, he he actually got off and he went he went straight back to um, the sort of Middle East, um, and the police the police state quote, police had found no other suspects for the murder, uh, and they weren't looking for anyone else, and, and it was just one of those cases where I think there was enough evidence, and, and I, I think he got off with it. So that was my my one and only sort of uh, final murder. <coughs> but it was literally like something out of a how am I doing for time Tim? Give me the wave. Yeah. I can rattle through a few. Yeah. Okay. I can rattle You're through a few more about sort of more more three or four more minutes. Okay, okay. right. This is a, just just gives you an idea of the scale of some of the fires you investigate. This is a, a hotel in uh, Bexhill that's no longer there, ground has huge in fact, sometimes I've been investigating things where do you start? And it's very difficult. And we used to joke that some of our colleagues used to say, "Well, if you tossed your coin today, what do you mean? You're that, that coin that says accidental one side and deliberate the other." <laughs> it was a bit like that sometimes because it's very difficult. <laughs> but you can you can do a bit more than that. There are witness evidences. You might get CCTV. And in this case, the bits of the building that were remaining, you know, there were there were bits of the hotel that had been set fire in different places. So, you know, you could conclude it's most likely deliberate. I wish to some of these from the conscious of time. Again, this gives you the how I haven't got a bad back all these, these years of shoveling stuff because this was a basement fire full of fire debris and I have to get it to something like that because you, you're trying to, like an archaeologist, you want to know what it looked like before, where things were, what the position was, what appliances were in place. Fitness first in Brighton, just down from the railway station, I think it's called something else now. Quite a big fire, 12 fire engines. Uh, oh dear, they haven't come out very well, have they? Lots and lots of damage, multi-million pound. Uh, I concluded this one, this is the sauna where I, I believe you know, it originated from. Again, everything falls in, you just, you can, there is physical evidence that, that points you back to where it most likely started. Uh, and, and when you finish up, um, just over here, uh, there's the sort of um, coal electronic sort of heating unit and you know basically I, I had to include that's probably the most likely ignition source someone might have left something on top of it or it's faulty this was um, um, a restaurant at Bright Marina this was really easy because there was CCTV footage <laughs> what was interesting here was I got it down to the fat fires because again this was above the hole in the roof so it was fairly easy for you obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you guys could have worked this one. Like what, what was quite interesting was again forensic scientists got involved in this because fires like this if it's a really you know an expensive loss insurers send their own independent forensic scientists and they'll work with us sometimes or they go in a day or two later. But what was really interesting, again, this is where you learn the lessons. About two weeks before, the engineer had been in to service the thing, and he left his report saying, oh yeah, you've got a faulty whatever valve it was. And they've carried on working with the thing, and think, hmm, I wonder if you're going to get a payout then or not. Probably not, hmm. Um, this is a kitchen fire. This is a clip, you must let me do this little story. <laughs> uh, attached house fire, four bedrooms attached house. Uh, this is all around the worktops, lots and lots of stuff, boxes of stuff that were put on the worktops because these people were moving and literally this was the day before they were completing and moving. Boxes and boxes of stuff. Quick, quick fire safety lesson here. Notice, look at the hallway, hardly touched because the door's shut by the way. Look at all the damage in the kitchen and look at the hallway. So, I do my thing, this is giving you a flavour of it, you see. I do my thing, I take everything off and lay it all out. And this was actually one of my easiest ever, I've got to be honest. But when I, when I took everything off and I looked at the worktops, lo and behold, this was the electronic hob, which still had power to it. You can't see them very clearly, but, but one knob was on and one knob was off. So clearly I picked up this box, put it on top and accidentally switched on the cooker. And the reason they'd done that, the reason they'd done that, and they were a bit unlucky, is because well, they've got this fridge freezer in the kitchen, it's defrosting, there'd been water everywhere. So why are all these boxes are neatly stacked up? Oh, I don't want to get all that stuff wet. Put it on the cooker, and, and, the, and that's the result. Uh, I'm virtually done, you'll be pleased to know. Crime scene, <laughs> crime scene, this is quite easy, just, just giving you a flavour of the diversity of stuff. It's easier when you go to a house and there's two or three different fires because, you know, well, someone's gone in and set fire to it. <laughs> you know, but so, so sometimes it is as simple as that and you get the police and you get them involved. 
Oh, right, what's this got to do with it? Ah, oh, look, I'll tell you a quick little story. This is my last slide. I did want to put a bit of humour in here. Yeah. This, is, this is a true story, because you'll recognise me there with, before I've got grey hair. But you'll also see there's a hand up here, and you'll see a bit of sort of spawned walls here. One of my first fire investigations, in fact, I'd had my fire investigation training and I was going through a period of, you know, like shadowing, coaching, call it what you will. So I was asked to go to this fire in Pumpkin, actually, and so a more experienced fire investigation officer was being sent. He was, he was going to lead, but I got there first and I thought, oh, I'll take some photos, that'd be a good idea. So I got my little camera out. In fact, I hadn't even got a firm's camera then. I had my own camera with me, but no, there's no problem. So I get the camera out, puts the film and starts snapping away. Now, then the photos come to headquarters and they say, oh, you know, we've got your whole face snaps. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same, you can see there's something going on here. And then I think back, I thought, oh yeah, when I pulled that film out, it was a bit stiff. And what had happened is, <laughs> in my keenness, I got this camera up horribly, and it was, because it was 35 mil camera, and, and the film had been rolled up, but it hadn't fully wound in, so there was a bit sticking out. So of course I get this, shh, pulls it out, puts it in the camera, and there we are. But a serious lesson, <laughs> a serious lesson actually, because when you're doing this sort of work, and this was a serious fire actually, this was a particularly serious fire, someone was yeah. nearly yeah. killed. Um, forensic scientists involved. And you have to disclose things like this. And it's a bit embarrassing when you say, oh yeah, this is a, one, of, one of the photos you're looking at. It's actually a holiday stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened. So, you know, um, I mean, I joke, but it did make me think, you know, you, you check and double check. Or as my late grandfather said, you measure twice, cut once, don't you? <laughs> so there we are. That's the impression. Thank you very much for that. I, I, um, I, I know nothing about fire investigation. It's always intrigued me as a, as, a, as a topic that actually, how on earth do you get to the bottom of, of how, you know, all that rubble, all that debris, how do you know? And, and now, we've, now, we, now we know that actually you can make it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is reassuring and lovely. In this, in this dark and probably very, very fire unsafe room. Yeah. Chris, you didn't hear that. We yeah. have. Fire uh, safety. I, I'm I'm safety. I'm I'm you can all get out of here. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Anybody got ah, here we are. Burning questions. Were you a firefighter before you became a fire investigator? Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, so I started as a firefighter. I started Preston Circus in Brian, some of you know it, and yeah. um, progressed, you know, progressed um, through exams and things and uh, finished up as a group manager. Um, so, you know, reasonably senior. Um, what's interesting, I, I didn't, didn't sort of get a chance to squeeze it in, but, but I did fire investigation for 10 years as a specialist fire investigation officer and did about 117 specialist, you know, fire investigations. But that was just a, a, an extra hat you wore. You had a day job, you might have been a training manager or a building district commander, so it was actually just a sort of bolt on there. Brilliant, yeah. Any other, any other? Yeah, so would you get called out day or night? As soon was it important for you to be there as soon as possible? Yeah, I mean, if you were an officer on call, you had the usual pager and the phone, and you, you, it was instant response. Yeah, the only thing with that was a bit different, particularly instance. If you're going as part of the instant command team, that's one thing. If you're a fire investigation officer, you, you could be a little bit slower in your response, shall we say? And also, sometimes you would go to a scene, and actually there might be a limit to what you could do then and you'd come back the next day and quite often you'd come back the next day because you'd have scenes of crimes so you have forensic scientists which is very interesting because then it's changed a bit now um, up in London there was forensic scientists sort of employed by the police but also uh, insurance companies have their own forensic scientists there's, there's companies like called uh, well it doesn't matter what they're called but there are independent that work for and you would try and do a joint investigation obviously yeah <coughs> Brilliant. Any more, any more questions? The, um, yes. So, if you're off duty and, and your neighbor's house is on fire, what, what would be your immediate response? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not asking you, I'm asking in general. Right? 
if the, the neighbour's house is on fire. <laughs> yeah, and what will the fire do? Well, I think, I think, I think that, there's, there's that, that kind of strap line of three things that has never really, really changed. Get out, stay out, get the fire service out. That hasn't really ever changed. I think, um, I wasn't going to mention it, but, but I will now. You've kind of triggered the thought. Is I think the, the tragic Grenfell thing will really change a lot of thinking. Um, <coughs> Because one of the things, that you may have seen it in the media, it, particularly in high rise and blocks of flats, is what they call a stay put policy. It's not everywhere, but because blocks of flats normally have a one hour fire resistance, when you ring up 909, you say, Oh, there's smoke out somewhere, flat, they say, You stay there, you're safe, you know, you've got protection for now. Well, things like Grenfell are, are going to change the thinking and it will change the legislation. But in terms of the domestic setting, you know, your house, your bungalow, it's, it's always get out, you know, stay out and get the fire service out. Yeah, yeah no, that's, yeah, and uh, very, very topical with the Grenfell mm -hmm. tragedy, obviously. So, uh, yeah, um, well, that's, unless anyone's got any more questions, I'm going to take, I can't really see, but um, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to, uh, to, then, to, to know that reassuringly when we hear those news reports about uh, how You'll this fire that. started, it will be, uh, it will be we'll, we'll know that the investigators will be tossed a coin. So. <laughs> so we're going to take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back to hear from Dan Hume who's going to tell us about the Emperor of the USA. So,